This is the last one in time. Professor Fernando Pirello, Director of the University, Professor Giancarlo Girardi, uh, who has been with the ICT for since its beginning. beginning <laughs> one of the founders almost. And we are glad of having you here both. Uh, Professor Girardi also wrote a uh, chapter of the book and he's given a talk on about tessellations, which is related to 3D printing, of course. And um, I, I would like to give a copy, color copy to <laughs> of the book. It became very popular. And we are glad to disseminate uh, the name of the ACPP around the world. So, uh, I don't know if you want to welcome. Yes, definitely. Yes, uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I yes, uh, cannot say welcome because you have been here already for a couple of days. <laughs> so, yes, uh, I have seen that. Well, this is uh, one of the one of the first initiatives to start activities on 3D printing. And uh, we have a very enthusiastic group doing uh, that here, and we hope that we can, this group together with other collaborators in different countries, we can try to start uh, activities to promote this, uh, this new technology to developing countries, which I think is important for, to, to start from the beginning, each of these countries to, to learn new techniques, because it looks that this is uh, going to be a big revolution in, in, uh, in technology. So we want to be always on the top of, of, of the, the latest developments, and this is uh, uh, what we are doing. And we are thankful to Enrique and Marco and, uh, and Carlo and, uh, and Manu also, you know, they have been working very hard on this. And so I think this is uh, very good that we are starting to be involved in this. And it looks that the printers get cheaper and cheaper, so <laughs> this become more and more available to people from developing countries. And the applications, I think, are countless, so it's, it's very good that we are part of this uh, big development. So but I hope that you enjoy this, and uh, hopefully this is only the first of uh, many activities in this field. I know it's a fast developing field, so it will be, probably next year will be completely different uh, printers that we, we may see. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the idea is eventually that we can try to have activities to, to, to promote these uh, techniques uh, regularly, so that uh, we can uh, be always following what the, the latest developments happen. Okay, so well, thank you very much, and I apologize that I won't be able to stay because I have other meetings. <laughs> and I apologize particularly to Giancarlo because uh -huh. I know he's been doing very nice uh, things. We know this, right? So thank you very much. Okay, okay thank so you, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank thank you. you. Yes. It's a big honor for me <laughs> to have been introduced by you. So can I start? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, let me just say that I feel a little bit out of my <laughs> usual role because I am a physicist working since many, many years in foundations of quantum mechanics. And so my interest, well, actually the interest in symmetries goes back to the 70s in which I wrote a book published by Marcel Decker, Symmetry Principle in Quantum Physics, a big book. But, uh, uh, well, in any case, today I will speak uh, specifically of the problem of tessellation. Unfortunately, I will confine my consideration to one and two dimensional spaces, Euclidean spaces, uh, because for in three dimension I will simply uh, show you some images of three dimensional tessellation. So, well, the problem is uh, the interplay between symmetry and art. Well, these are my affiliation. I go on. The important point is that during the age, the concept of symmetry has played a more and more relevant role, in particular in art and in science. Symmetry consideration, the manifestation of symmetry, the meaning, the aspect, also the formal one, have represented a conceptual instrument which has progressively displayed an increasing depth and richness and an unexpected effectiveness in most various fields. I would say that the use of symmetry principle illustrates quite nicely Wigner's statement that uh, is on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in understanding the world, or something like that. <laughs> okay, I will limit my attention to symmetry in art, and specifically to some aspects which are interesting for visual art, in a wide sense, and which show the interplay of the diverse aspects of mankind, the logical and aesthetic one with particular reference to human creativity. 
Okay, I will analyze two ornamental techniques which are based on a systematic use of the basic principle of symmetry. Their fundamental characteristics derive from the fact that they are based on a periodic repetition of a given pattern. Well, periodic structure can obviously occur in one, two or three dimensions. For our purposes, it, I will mi limit myself to consider the one and two dimensional cases. Well, to grasp the beauty and the logical rigor of the procedure, we need some formal elements. In particular, the first thing that we have to consider is the transformation of the plane into itself. So I will consider transformation of the two-dimensional space because I will deal mainly with two-dimensional images. There are correspondences between the point of ordinary space and I will project some figure in a moment with some characteristic feature. They are one-to-one -one so that they have an inverse. They map the whole plane onto itself and they preserve the distance between the point so they are isometries in technical language. Well, the typical transformation of this type are the space translation, the point P goes into the point P star, Q goes into Q star and all points of the plane are translated. The other transformation is a reflection in a line, so P goes to P star, which is the mirror image of P with respect to that mirror. Rotation of a given angle, so you see that uh, all the points are rotated of this angle, so P goes into P star and Q goes into Q star, which makes the same angle. And then there are glide reflection, which are a translation of a given amount followed by a reflection in a plane which is parallel to the direction of translation. These are the basic transformation from which all transformation in a plane uh, can be written, can be expressed. Well, now I would like to make precise the concept of invariance of a system or an object under a given transformation. And so a, an object is invariant under a given transformation if and only if, that is the meaning of the 2F, it is transformed into itself when the points of the plane are subjected to the considered transformation. For instance, here I have a clear image which is invariant for reflection in this line. If you reflect it, you get that image which is the same. Here I have something that if you reflect it, it goes into that which is not the original image. So this is not invariant for reflection. The first one is invariant for reflection. The second one is not. Well, another interesting transformation I have mentioned is the translation symmetry. And so, for instance, if I have this pattern of uh, colored cones uh, or triangles, whatever you want, uh, they are invariant for the translation that I have indicated. Obviously, you have to think that this is uh, infinitely extended so that if you make this displacement, this cone goes into this, this goes into this, but you can also make a multiple displacement, so a displacement of two, and the figure turns out to recover itself completely. Okay. Well, the appropriate mathematical language to deal with symmetry transformation is group theory, which is a set of transformation of the plane. Well, this is not particularly important. It is important to know that composing two transformations, you get again a transformation of the same family, that is to say of the same group. They include the identity transformation and any transformation as an inverse. For instance, it is obvious that the set of rotation around the point is a group because if you rotate of 30 degrees and you rotate still of 40 degrees, this amounts to a rotation of 70 degrees around that point, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, an important remark, the set of the symmetry transformation of an object is a group because if an object is left invariant by a given transformation, it is in left invariant by the inverse transformation which brings it back to the original shape. If it is invariant for one transformation, which means it coincides with itself after the first transformation. If you make a second transformation which leaves it coinciding with itself, also if you compose the two you have, so this is a group. The group, the set of the transformation of symmetry transformation of an object is a group. Okay. Well, now I will consider periodic patterns, that is to say figures which are invariant under the translation group. So I have something like this. I had taken the figures that I have proved before. 
this is the group because you can make one translation or a translation of a double amount or a triple amount and so on and so forth. Every translation has its inverse, which is the inverse transformation and so on. So it is a group if you displace all the figure, which is infinitely extended, of a quantity n delta with n zero plus or minus one plus or minus two and so on and so forth. Well, the important thing is that I can enrich, because I am interested to, uh, in images which have the invariant for translation, but I can have further symmetry, and this interplay of the basic translational invariance and further symmetry is quite interesting in general. For instance, this pattern is invariant only for translation. It has only the translational periodical symmetry. However, if you consider this, you see that I have enriched the figure by introducing these cones that were not there before. Now, if you rotate of 180 degrees around this point, this cone goes into this, this cone goes into the one that should be there, and so on and so forth. So this new figure are, is invariant also for rotation of 180 degrees around the appropriate point. Okay, the problem is that you can have restriction of possible symmetries because the periodicity implies restriction on the possible symmetries. Well, since our pattern has a one-dimensional translation invariance, obviously there must be a line which goes into itself when you make a transformation of this sort. And so the transformation as a whole must fix a line, that is to say must leave a line unchanged. And the only transformation which fix a line are half turn, that is to say turn of 180 degrees around one of the points of the line, reflection in the line, if you have an ex something which is periodic in this direction, but it has also an extension in the other direction, reflection in a line orthogonal to the line, and glide reflection with respect to the line. And I will come back here again to the glide reflection. You see these are the, the steps of somebody walking on the sand or something like that. So you have essentially the translation invariant because if you shift all the image of this quantity, this foot goes on to this, this goes on to this, and this goes on to this. But it has also a further symmetry, which is a glide reflection, because if you translate the image of one half the distance and then you make a reflection, this goes into this, this goes into this, this goes into this, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a very simple example of a, a pattern which are invariant both for translation and the further invariant for glide reflection. Well, now I would like to uh, stress that when you are discussing of patterns which are invariant for translations, you have only seven different types of freezes uh, from the point of view of their principle of symmetry. Uh, this means that any conceivable one-dimensional periodic pattern belongs to one, one-dimensional in the sense that it has one-dimensional translation invariant, it can be extended in the other direction, belongs to one of the seven groups that I will describe. There are infinitely many different specific freezes, but they can be grouped into set which coincide from the point of view of their symmetry. And here you see the unifying power of symmetry principle. Well, a sketchy representation of the seven group is this one. You see, these are only invariants for translations. This, the second one, are invariant for translation and for reflection in this line. These are invariant for translation of this amount, but also for reflection in this plane orthogonal. These are invariant for a glide reflection. If you go there and then you reflect, you have this one. And these are one and two the, the pedices of those F indicate whether there is an invariant for rotation of 180 degrees or not in the figure, so uh, you have three kinds of this. Now I will give you the key to understand, to identify to which group a given freeze belongs. So, first of all, you ask, does my figure be, is, is my figure invariant for half turns? Well, the answer can be no or yes. Suppose it is no, then you ask, 
Is my figure invariant for reflection in an horizontal axis? Again, the answer can be no and yes. Sorry, if it is yes, you end up there. If it is no, you ask, is my figure invariant for reflection in a vertical plane? Then you can have the answer no and yes. And then the final question is, is my figure invariant for glide reflection? Again, you have no and you are in F1, yes, and you are in that case. On the other hand, if you have answered yes to the question, is my figure invariant for afterns, you can ask, is my figure invariant for reflection in an horizontal axis? You have the answer no and yes. Yes, the story ends up. If you have no, then you can go on and you have no and yes, and you see that this F1, uh, well, all these are the seven groups of invariants of an object like this. Okay, now let, for instance, just to illustrate the, what I have done, and so I, we will go on through our our previous uh, description. So we will ask: Do we have invariant for our turn? Do we have invariant for according to the answer? So let me take this Egyptian freeze. And is it invariant for afternoon? I have rotated it of 180 degrees. No, for sure. It is invariant for re uh, horizontal reflection? For sure not. Is it invariant for vertical reflection? No, because if you make the vertical reflection, the head of these animals point to the opposite direction in which those. Obviously, they cannot be invariant also for glide reflection, because a glide reflection implies a reflection, and so you have the head down instead of hanging up. So you have answered no to all your questions, and so according to our previous scheme, these are the symmetry group F1. Uh, you see, mm, sorry, I have... You see, we have answered no, there are no after, there are no reflection in that, there are no vertical reflection, there is no re uh, glide reflection invariant. And so we have ended up with the symmetry F1. That has only the translational invariance, no more invariant than that. Uh, sorry to go again uh, through this game. Now, I will consider this, which is, a, a, I think, uh, a renascimental uh, freeze, and this is the original. And obviously it is invariant for half turn, because if you rotate of 180 degrees around the yellow point, obviously that flower, let us say, goes into this. And so it is invariant for rotation. Well, horizontal reflection for sure not, because the big flower goes into the small and vice versa. But vertical reflection, yes, because if you reflect in this plane, you have that, you, you can imagine to have a mirror there, and it is invariant for this. Then you can go through my table, and uh, if you follow the key, you discover that this phrase belongs to the F22 family. Well, let me make a parenthesis. Uh, uh, some years ago, I was in a meeting in Lozini, and there was a lady from UNESCO that was telling that in order to involve people, uh, they were using some of the, uh, of the aborigines to make ornament in their house or something like that. And he has shown some friezes. In particular, this is one of the friezes that was, or, uh, was an ornamental uh, enrichment of the house of some guy. Well, let us look at this from our point of view. There is no doubt that these two points are a point of invariance for rotation of 180 degrees. Uh, well, there is no doubt that this is invariant for horizontal reflection in a plane which goes in this way, and so it is transformed into itself. And so at this point, according to our scheme, you conclude that it is of the F21 play, uh, class. Well, this was the other image that they have shown, the lady has shown, which is a fertility image, which is a woman, obviously. It is obvious that it is not invariant for after, it is not invariant for horizontal reflection, but it is invariant for vertical reflection if you take the vertical plane passing through the middle of one of these figures or the middle 
of separating one of the two figures. So if you follow my game, you discover that these are the symmetry F12. And now let me make a list of some historical example of freezes for all seven symmetry groups. Oh, sorry. These are, well, the first is the one that I have already shown, and they have freezes which fall under all the group that I have considered. Well, what is interesting is that, let's suppose you take this, which is a Greek, uh, a Greek uh, freeze, and then it is F12, keep in mind this, Oh my God, what happened? Uh, why it does not work? Well, let me make a long story short. I don't understand because I told me it went perfectly. So I will go back. It is F12 and so it is this one. So the symmetry of that Greek freeze is exactly the symmetry of this image of the people from Cameroon. Let me go on with this and let me take this freeze, which is very complicated apparently. Why it does not go back? Yes, it is a F21, which means that these are the same symmetry as this freeze. So that complicated Greek free is, is just the same as this from the point of view of symmetry. Okay, now I can go on, I hope. Okay. Well, whatever periodic one-dimensional pattern you can imagine, its structure from the symmetry which characterizes it reproduces one of the seven symmetry groups, the so-called freeze group I have just mentioned. What is extremely interesting is that the example of all the considered classes can be found in ornamental pattern since prehistoric times. So they have identified all the groups. Now we pass to a more complicated case, the case of two-dimensional periodic patterns. Okay, two-dimensional periodic pattern, an important concept is a two-dimensional lattice that you are familiar is a set of points whose neighborhoods are absolutely identical. It is important to keep distinct the idea of the lattice, which is a sort of skeleton of the periodic structure from the lattice complex, which is what is around the lattice, that is to say the actual neighborhood of each lattice point where repetition allows to reconstruct the whole <coughs> pattern. Well, and so let me just come immediately. You see here a pattern which is periodic and you can understand why this is the lattice because any one of these points all the rest of the universe look at that from one of these points appears exactly the same apart from the colors i have put the colors but suppose they are all white <laughs> so you have this so this is a, lat a possible lattice however you can translate the lattice parallel to itself and for instance if you would choose the lattice which is simply this translated of this quantity and this this is the lattice given by the red point. You see that any point is exactly, it has an environment which is exactly the same as the previous case. So the lattice is something which characterizes the structure. It gives, it tells to you which kind of translation, which means a translation like this plus one like this, brings me to a point which is exactly the same as the one that I had before, that I had before. Okay, let me take this out. This is the lattice, and now I have put also the lattice complex, but however, you could also take the lattice and change the different lattice complex. And in the next slide, I have shown to you, well, this is the way in which the first version of the lattice complete the thing, and there you have a completion with the other lattice. Uh, <coughs> group um, environment, let us say. Okay, well, a 
periodic pattern in two dimensions is characterized by the two elementary transformation that I have already called to your attention, represented in the figure. However, we can have further symmetry besides those related to the considered transformation. For instance, with reference to the symmetry for rotation, the so-called crystallographic restriction arises. It constrains the angles to have one of the following values, 60, 90, 120, 180. Well, uh, well, I will skip this, but the idea is very simple. Suppose this is, uh, these are two points of the lattice, and there are two points which represent the minimum distance between the point of the lattice. And you raise the question, can the lattice have a symmetry for rotation of one-fifth of a complete tour? That is, so you have a, a rotation of 72 degrees. This brings B in B star, and from B you make the same rotation, and you get A star. So if you would have a pentagonal symmetry in this lattice, you would have that B star and A star must be point of the lattice. But if you have assumed that the distance AB is the minimal distance between two points of the lattice, A star, B star, have a distance which is smaller than that. So you get a contradiction, which is a proof that you cannot have invariant for rotation of one-fifth of a tour uh, in, a, in a lattice. Okay, so the only allowed rotation are those of 60, 19, 120, and 180 degrees. And you see immediately this, this is a square or a rectangular thing. This, if you make the rotation, you get another point of the lattice, which is here, so essentially it is the same. And here is a rotation of 180 degrees, which reproduces the lattice. Okay, so I, now I would like to try to, un, to make you very clear why uh, the translational invariance put restriction. So let me start from this elementary lattice, and this, it is obviously invariant for rotation of 180 degrees around the red point. It goes into itself. It is infinitely extended, and so on. However, now, suppose I add to the elementary cell, so this is the lattice, and this is the lattice complex, so I have a tile in my <laughs> basement in which I have designed this triangle. So I raise the question, is this invariant for rotation of 180 degrees around B? So if I make the rotation, I get that image, and this image shows that this cannot be because I want to have the translational invariance. What is the, the appropriate figure? The appropriate figure, which are the translational invariant for these two translations, is this one, which brings this triangle in this triangle. But that does not happen there. So you don't have, in this case, invariance for rotation of 180 degrees, in this case. Now, let us see if we can enrich the, the symmetry in such a way to have also this. Suppose I, I start with a tile which is like this, so I have now two triangles which are obtained one from the other by rotating them of 180 degrees, and then it is obvious that if you have this structure, if you rotate by 180 degrees around here, this goes here, this goes here, and so on, and the figure is invariant. So this is a pattern which, beside the translation and symmetry, because if you make a translation of this amount and this amount, you go from this triangle to another triangle, it has also the invariance for the rotation of 180 degrees. Okay, well, further symmetries for rotation of 180 degrees arise, which I have shown them there. Well, let me go on, but well, there have been a lot of discussion about the identification of the 17 wall patterns group, and for the first time the classification has been given by Fedorov, and then it has been obtained by Polya and Nigli in 1924. So it's relatively recent, let us say. Uh, well, so I will, uh, no, I will simply show you patterns built up with my triangles, which have all the invariances that they have. The first one has only translation and invariant. The second one is also invariant for rotation of 180 degrees. Then we have rotation of 90 degrees, and we can have this, and here the solid line are 
line for which you have an invariant for reflection in the solid line, while the, the, the dashed line are lines for which you have an invariant for a glide reflection along those lines. And so this characterizes the symmetric structure of all the pattern. Then we have those based on a rectangle, fundamentally, and then we have those based on uh, essentially equilateral triangles and rhombuses which are made of two equilateral triangles. And these, if you count, they are just the 17 groups that we were discussing before. Okay, for instance, if you take this, you see that they have put here an hexagon to prove that these are an invariance for rotation of 60 degrees around that point. Well, and apart from the fact that it is not particularly uh, correct, this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 degrees. Well, it does not go perfectly up, but it, has in, it is invariant for rotation of 60 degrees around that point. Okay. Well, the three-dimensional case I will only mention because you work in, always in three dimension appropriately. For instance, this is a, a drawing by Hue in his crystallographic book in which you have a tessellation of the space by rhomboedra, and so you can get these things. But you can also have a tessellation by cubes, and you understand from this that also if you start Ah, missing one line, another line, and so on and so forth. You have these faces, and this is the reason for which the crystal have faces which make absolutely perfect angle among themselves according to the crystallographic groups to which they belong. Just to have some more example of three-dimensional tessellation, this is a tesselling unit, as you can see from there. Here you have a tessellation made by two kind of tiles uh, that they have represented there. And here you have a very complicated tessellation that I will not discuss, which is made by a combination of various uh, solids which, have, which are constructed by the part that they have built there. OK, so let's now come to the historic part. So the Arabs and the graphic world of Mauritius Escher. Well, it is extremely interesting to remark that much before any systematic investigation of this problem, the Arabs have made resort to all 17 symmetry groups. As Martin has commented in his transformation geometry, this discovery based on intuition of the ornamental groups constitutes one of the highest mathematical achievements preceding modern times, because it took up to the end of the 19th century to get the mathematical proof that these 17 are the only periodic patterns in two dimensions. Okay, the Islamic religion, however, did not allow to represent living figure, and this gives rise to a story concerning Escher. Well, let us start with some experience. Escher has always been intrigued by the interplay between the figure and the background. I would like to stress that this is very strictly connected to the Gestalt philosophy, and in Trieste we have Kanitza, now he's dead, who is one of the guys who has produced many of those images in which you don't know which is the image and which is the background, like the cup with the two profiles or something like that. Okay, in 1936, the practice of Escher sees a remarkable change because in that year he had the opportunity of studying the Arabic ornamental pattern used in the Ravello Cathedral, in Alhambra, and in La Mezquita. He's fascinated and he starts to copy, and here I have drawing from the Ravello Cathedral by Escher and his wife. And this is the Alhambra, and you can discover, for instance, that here you have this red and black and this white thing which <coughs> are tesseling thing. You can look that here you have the tesseling white and red and, uh, objects. So uh, the Arabic ornamentation made a systematic use of this tessellation. Well, these are Escher's drawing from Alhambra, and you see, for instance, this one, which is the one that they have 
that appeared in the lower part of the previous picture, of the previous picture. Uh, well, all these images are, are, uh, are characterized by a regular repetition of geometric fe figures. However, well, let me go quickly. Uh, I have been informed of the importance of tesseling for crystallography. Well, however, also the crystal have a fundamental geometrical structure. So he started to study the problem in a more systematic way. For instance, this is something that he copied from Polya's uh, book about symmetry. And you have an example of the 17 symmetry group that I have mentioned up to now. Let me skip this part. So he raised the following question. Which kind of periodical images should one use? Irregular, uniform shape which can raise in our mind simple association of thought, or abstract and geometrical figure, rectangle, hexagon, which can at best remind us of a chessboard or a nest of bees? No, we are not blind, deaf, and dumb. We consciously observe the shapes surrounding us, which in their variety speak to us with a precise and stimulating language. Accordingly, the shape we will use to build a regular division of the plane must be recognizable as sign, as specific symbol of the living or dead matter around us. If we are going to create a universe, this cannot be abstract or indefinite, but it must be the true image of things that we can recognize. We are going to build a two-dimensional universe made by an infinite repetition of identical constituents, which, however, must be clearly recognizable. It might be a universe of stones, of stars, of plants, of animals, or even of human beings. And so I will now show you some example of Asher tiling. This is done by this uh, bird, and this is something in which the basic unity with tiles is the union of a fish and a bird. This is the basic tessel which is repeated infinitely times. So it is a tessellation with two fundamental tiles, if you want to use the technical language. I will go on with some examples. These are dragonflies, and you see the dragonflies which are blue in this direction, and the white dragonflies in this direction. In this direction. I will also show another image of Escher, which is well known. It's this uh, man of the wood, I don't know what, <laughs> which is also a wonderful image. And now I will come to an image that you can find in many books on elementary particle physics. And the image is this one, the famous uh, <clears throat> Cavalieri, I, I don't know, Knights, <laughs> or whatever you want. Well, why? So if you allow me a very, very short uh, <laughs> jump into pure physics, I will try to make understandable to you why this image has played an important role in physics and you find it in elementary uh, particle physics book. <coughs> so, a digression, parity and matter-antimatter conjugation. So, now I pass from art to science, physical processes, so the idea of symmetry becomes the one of invariance of the physical law which govern a process. Well, up to 1956, all scientists were convinced that nature exhibits invariance for mirror reflection. If a process is possible, then also its mirror image is a possible process. But this is not true, as it has been discovered under the suggestion of Lee and Yang, and by the experiment of Madame Wu, the cobalt 60 atom decays in a way which is a right hand screw, and so it distinguishes right from left, in a sense. So it is not invariant for reflection. Well, immediately after that, Various scientists, among them Abdus Salam, suggested that nature is invariant under the combined transformation of parity and of the replacement of matter with antimatter, called charge conjugation. So let us suppose we consider an image a la Escher, and well, parity is simply a reflection in a mirror, but charge conjugation will be if the image is made of black and white to exchange the black with white, matter with antimatter. So let us consider this example. You have the dragonflies, 
and you make a reflection in a mirror which is vertically oriented, you get this image and the image is equal to the original image. So you have invariance for reflection. Obviously we have to consider that infinitely extended. On the contrary, if you make matter-antimatter conjugation, so you exchange the white with the black, then this is not invariant, because here the dragonflies white are going vertically, while here they are going horizontally. And so it is not invariant. So this is an example of a pattern which is invariant for parity, but not for the combined transformation of parity and charge conjugation, just because it is not invariant for charge conjugation. However, if you go to this image and you make the reflection, obviously if you put a mirror, what happens is that the Yes, <laughs> these guys are oriented in the opposite way, the black ones. On the contrary, if you make matter and antimatter conjugation, again you exchange the white with the black, and so you get this. But this is perfectly equal to that. It coincides with that, which means that if you start from this image, you make a reflection, then this image is this, because this and this are absolutely identical. You make matter-antimatter conjugation, you go back. So the original image is invariant for the combined transformation of space reflection and exchange of white with black, so matter, antimatter, and this is the fundamental reason for which it has become so popular. Well, the strict interrelation, the enormous interest that scientists have shown for Escher work, which I hope to have motivated for you, have been summarized by Locker in his presentation of Escher work. For scientists, just as for Escher, the plurality of the world does not mean that it is either absurd or chaotic. On the contrary, it represents a challenge to discover new logical relation between the phenomena. And this is the end of my talk, apart from the fact that if you want, if you have read on the booklet, I could try to project to you very quickly, it takes exactly two minutes, the images that I have drawn a la Escher for a very strange and peculiar reason to have a tarot deck uh, give, uh, represented a la Escher. Well, this concludes my talk. Uh, <laughs> Let me see, yes. I hope it will work. Why it does not appear? Perché non si vede? I am very photo. No, 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 This is the queen, the emperatrix. This is the emperor, it is on a symmetry of 120 degrees. This is the pope. This is the lowest in which there is a man and two ladies because he has to choose between profane and sacred love. This is a chariot. This is the justice. This is the hermit. This is the wheel of fortune, which is very complicated from a symmetry point of view. This is a force in the standard deck, there is a lion. This is the angered man, which is angered by one of his feet. This is the death. This is the temperance that I have already shown to you. This is the devil, the tower, 
the star, the moon, in the card of the moon there is a crab also, this is the sun, in the card there are two twins, <laughs> this is the judgment, this is the, un the world, and then I went on to prepare a complete deck, so these are the jacks, these are the horses, <laughs> these are the queens, then you can change the stick with spade, these are the kings, and then I have made the background to make all the cards, here is the three of cup, but you can color more cup, the five of spades, the six of sticks, and the fifth of coins. And then this is the back of the cards. And this ends up my... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Did you actually print and play with the card? Sorry? Did you actually print those cards and play with them? No. But there is one thing that I want to point out, that when I have done this, which means 35 years ago, more or less, and then I have left them on a drawer, <laughs> uh, I have made them by hand. They are not made with a computer. <laughs> so it has been a terrible war. <laughs> I made by hand and photocopying them, uh, putting them together, then taking picture in black and white, and then from the back I was painting them with acrylic colors in order to give the colors. So it had been, uh, there had been a time in which Franco Maria Ricci, who is an, an editor of Italian art books, was interested, but then he had uh, financial difficulties, and then after that I never <laughs> tried to contact new editors. <laughs> Escher uh, is really well known for his uh, Circle Limit series, where he does tessellations of uh, hyperbolic geometry. And oh, well, all the projections of this geometry yes. are very beautiful uh, drawings. Could you say something about, kind of, does this change kind of fundamentally how tessellations work? Symmetry groups, I think, are going to be different when, you, when your space is different. Well, uh, obviously, Oh, uh, I, I, I would like to add something. Yes, no, no, I, am, I have discussed periodic tessellation in the standard way. There are even, and it is very, very interesting, aperiodic tessellation, the most interesting ones are those uh, devised by Roger Penrose, because they are very interesting, that is to say they are, uh, you have a tessellation, you have the possibility with the tessel to cover the whole plane. However, there is no point in which the whole universe around you it looks exactly the same. However, no matter which area you take, there is another place in which for that area you have exactly the same situation. And it is very important to consider this non-periodic tessellation because he has proven that if you go to non-periodic tessellation, you can have five-fold symmetry, that is to say the crystallographic restriction does not apply, and you know that uh, crystallographer had some images which were uh, trying to point out to a pentagonal symmetry of the crystal, which is forbidden by the crystallographic tessellation, and so Penrose tilings account for this, uh, this kind of structure, the quasi-crystal, so-called. Well, for what concerns the rest, it is obvious that if you have a plane, you can project it, introducing other geometries in many ways. For instance, you can take a point, and then you project them on a circle, and you have the whole universe uh, projected, reduced to that circle. In this case, you have a deformation of the images as you go to the, to the border, and so you have the classical, and then you can have spherical, hyperbolic, and all kind of, of tessellation in a space in which you have made a transformation which simply transforms the, the whole plane into a finite region. And so since you have to put infinitely many figures, they have to become smaller and smaller in order to stay in a finite region, fundamentally.
but that, that it's not difficult to transform a tessellation of the plane in a tessellation of Asher. Even so, you must be smart like Asher to make them so nice and to choose the appropriate images to make them, this game. How things change a lot in cube space? I don't know. You mean tesseling a sphere? Well, Escher has tesselled a sphere various times with sculpture or something like that. I have never studied in that this problem. I think that it does not change because, however, the problem of mapping a plane into a sphere has some, some problem because in the Escher, uh, tessellation of a sphere, the size of the image remains the same. And if you make the standard way of transforming a plane on a sphere, you have some deformation. So I, I must confess that I have not studied that point. It's, it's quite, yeah. But I mean, the big difference is that uh, on the circle, the inner sum of angles in a convex polygon is always larger than 360. Yes. Right? So the tessellations, they change, all the rules for tessellation, they change. The and the chains also depend on the size and sure. of the object you want to, to tessellate. It's, it becomes interesting in a very unintuitive way. I'm to the size. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Okay.